Welcome to the Anxious Voyage. If you think that title sounds bleak or foreboding, one of two things must be true. You're very lucky or you need to get out more. On this program, we share stories of life and living. We compare notes. We discover commonalities. We accept that life is a glorious, heartbreaking thing, and we embrace and celebrate all of it. Take the ride with us. We're glad you're here. Now, here's your host, Mark O'Brien. Hello, hello, welcome indeed. Uh, we are coming to you once again, and as always, from World Headquarters in uh, beautiful Middletown, Connecticut. Uh, this weekend, um, we will be celebrating, I, actually, I should say conducting, the 105th annual clam races. Uh, Main Street will be blocked to uh, vehicle traffic, so you probably want to get early, uh, get here early to ensure yourself uh, a parking space. Um, before I introduce my guest, I just want to give the benefit uh, to our audience of the sort of backstory here. So um, a little while ago, I was, I don't know, four or five credits short or something like that for my uh, PTC, uh, which is my professional troublemakers certification. So it occurred to me that if I introduced these three characters to each other, uh, they would create so much trouble of all kinds that I'd be a shoe in. So sure enough, what happened was after I did that, I was named honorary chairman of the PTA, which is the Professional Troublemakers Association. So to all three of you, I have to say thank you. Um, I couldn't have done it without you and you're all just amazing. So I will uh, introduce you in the order that I see you um, on my screen. We have this sort of uh, Hollywood Squares thing working here. So Diane Wiska is from Whidbey Island, Washington, mm -hmm. um, former Navy nurse and attorney. That just uh, boggles my mind. And now, would it, would it be fair to say story coach? Story guide. Story guide. There we go. Uh, Gina Mazza, you live in Tennessee somewhere. And you are also uh, a poet, uh, a writer, and a publisher, or, or at least aggregator of uh, collections of poetry. Um, and I, I will share with you now that when I share, I'll ask you for more information later, but when I share the recording of this uh, broadcast later this week, I'm gonna put a link to each of your websites so people will be able to find you. And Gail, you are a ghostwriter for, particularly for women's memoir, is that correct? Yes, it is. And uh, of course, I've read um, a book that I think is 10 years old now, Finding Zoe, which was just incredible. So the, the first thing I wanna ask the three of you is, um, since, since you are all, uh, since you all help people facilitate their writing, where the hell were you when I needed you? What do you mean by that? <laughs> I mean, you just, you left me out there winging it. I, I, yeah, I but how out. many books you got out there, Mark? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. Okay, we don't we don't need to go there right now. So I, I would like to know from each of you in no particular order, how how it is that you chose that that work? Going to pick on somebody? Okay, I'm gonna start with you, Gina. How how and why do you do what you do? And what is it? I'm going to guess it has to do with an affinity, an affinity for language. And if it's not that, how and why is it that you do what you do? I do feel like it chose me really early on in my life. And you're right. I mean, it is an affinity for language. My favorite childhood book was the Webster Dictionary. I would um, create games for myself of like, if I didn't know a word, I would put it on a, on a rule line paper of list of things, you know, words to learn. I mean, I was very young, very, very young. Um, yeah, I just always loved the, the lyricism and language of, of uh, writing uh, words. And jump ahead to, you know, my teenage years, I would say that 
the work that I do now was precipitated by, you know, certain individuals in my life, whether they were, you know, family or teachers or whatever, that kind of discouraged me from uh, expressing myself creatively, not just with writing, but with dance. You know, I was told, oh, you can't make a living at that or get a real job, you know, kind of thing. Um, and so I think it really set the stage for my wanting to help other people who write or want to write overcome those voices that aren't their own <laughs> and uh, the voices in their head from society, from people that they know, or just in general, um, not feeling confident enough to tell their story, to help them through that and to get them to a place where they're able to freely create and feel really good about it and have fun with it. Mm -hmm. Gail, what, what, what brought you to the work you do? And forgive me if I seem at all distracted while you're talking, um, but I'm, I'm making notes here because this is already brilliant. So what, what is it that brought you to what you do, Gail? Hmm. A, a lot of things. Um, I always was good with words and was a writer. And when I was a teenager, I wrote poetry and songs and music and all that stuff. And... Um, I started my career as an advertising copywriter. I mean, the thought of writing a book didn't even, it was not me, but I felt that I could earn a living writing ad copy. It just, mm. I always joke, I tell people I came out writing headlines. It was just something that was just, was easy. It just, it came through me, you know? But it was really when I wrote my first book, um, it was a self-help book. And it was exactly what you talked about, Gina. It was about learning how to tell the difference between <clears throat> our true, the voice of our heart, as opposed to the voices of that yakety yak, yak, yak. <clears throat> I realized that I had a book in me, <clears throat> excuse me, that I could not not write. And so I wrote that book. And I was fortunate because I was able to find a literary agent and I found a publisher. And the book was for women specifically, but it had a lot and it had a lot of my personal story in it. And so after that book came out, it was really a natural a natural extension for me. I felt that I need to help women share their stories. But the thread is really the healing because I was always drawn to my spirituality and storytelling is so healing. The, it's the universal nature of storytelling. And that first book that I wrote, it was in, it's entitled Your Heart Knows the Answer, How to Trust Yourself and Make the Choices that Are Right for You. It's that old saying that we teach what we need to learn and that was so completely what was happening for me. Like I just, I really got into my, my own healing. It, it, it just like nothing was more important for me. And I think you all know me well enough <laughs> that I'm still that way, you know? And so that was really the, the extension after I wrote that book that it was just like, I'm for women and I'm for healing. And that's what I have to do. Oh, I mm -hmm. love that. I have to do. Mm -hmm. uh, Diane, um, especially, I suppose, because you've been on the show before, I, I know a little bit about why you do what you do, but given the varied nature of your background, um, and I'm going to sort of steal an idea from Gina, what, what, what is it that called you to what you do? I can say... I was called to walk the Camino. Mm. I can say I was called to an outward bound two week adventure in the Rocky Mountains. I can say I was called to various events in my life, but I cannot say with the same clarity that I was called to this work. Now, that could be because it's it's whispering and I'm not listening or it's still waiting for me to recognize what a calling to this work is. 
what I can tell you is that I came up at a time when children were supposed to be seen and not heard. And it's dumb because I can't imagine that there's any kid out there that doesn't want to be heard. And yet that notion was reinforced in churches and in schools and in communities. And the overall effect for children coming up, especially girl children, was not to have a voice because you're not supposed to. And, and I think we bought into it or we were bought into it, or we, maybe we were sold into it. And so over time, the work that I did do, whether it was in nursing or business or law or story, had to do with voice, saying what you mean and meaning what you say. And so when I came to Whidbey, I was at a crossroads. So my litigation consulting practice of a dozen years had pretty much ended. There were a lot of changes in the litigation world. And here I had washed up on an island wondering, now what do I do? We have many, many, many artists on the island. And I thought, okay, let's figure out something that has to do with story, with a nod to the art of it, as well as the science. And as I began to explore what that next chapter or epoch in my life was going to be like, I recognized that it's we're back to voice again. We're back to helping women say what they mean and mean what they say. And more importantly, helping them in their work be seen, heard, understood, and listened to. Because that fades, whether you know it's fifth grade, sixth grade, seventh grade, that notion of being seen and not heard is still there. It's still prevalent. So the work that I do, I think really does come down to that. If I wanted to resurrect my life, how did I go about doing that? And once I figured that out with the help of the world, then how can I help other women connect their narratives amplify their voices, say what they mean and mean what they say. So I, I think in um, I think it does circle around. And maybe that's a calling. All I know is this is who I am right now. That's it. Um, sorry to get all excited about that. But when <laughs> you were talking about the things that you were called to or called to do, I was wondering, is, is there a difference? And I, I would like to know what all three of you think about this. Is there a difference between what we might take to be our calling and who we are? And, 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 and I ask that in part because I, for one, feel much more like who I am today than I ever did. And I otherwise, I think I otherwise would have called writing my calling. But now I'm thinking as a result of what you just said, maybe it's not. Maybe it's who I am. Maybe it's who I always was. What 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 do any of you think about that? Maybe it's your writing that's the expression of your who. Mm -hmm. So when I work with women, I, I go back to Simon Sinek and say, yes, knowing what your why is is important. But preceding your why is your who. So when we go back to do the archaeological dig on ourselves and looking through that past civilization, looking for those, those tips and clues and thoughts, the little shards of pottery that are in the sand, the values and the beliefs that we had when we were five and six and seven, because things are pretty much formed by then. So it could be that the way in which we express our who, and say in your case, Mark, is by what we produce or create. So the calling 
with the cosmic contract that we signed might be the agreement to show up as your who and express your who in your particular way, which in your case, in part, is writing. Um, Gina and um, Gail, I would still like to hear what you think about this, but I'm, I'm being partly facetious when I say this. Diane, I think we're on the verge of a Dr. Seuss book because I, I wonder if the question should be, why are you your who? Um, and I think I have an answer for that, but uh, Gina, Gail, I would love to hear for, from you on the difference between if there is one, your calling and who you are. I think a calling is, in my experience, it's something that won't let you rest. Like it, it won't be denied until you pay attention to it. And there's, there's a propulsion towards it that isn't energetic necessarily. It can be effortless. It's like always there waiting to be received by you. Whereas the outside world is all about effort and productivity and pushing and striving and goal setting and all of that. Calling is just you know, just in its own graceful way, just sitting there waiting for you to acknowledge it and to run towards it in some way. So in in my experience, what I do and who I am is one and the same. Mm -hmm. um, it's so interconnected and so interdependent that you know, and I feel like story is that way. Like story in general is the reason why it's so effective is because it doesn't pick apart disparate parts of our beingness. It's able to, you know, be large enough to hold the entirety of the essence of, of life, of existence, of, of what we do and who we are. And it shows the connections between all of that. Um, that's why sometimes, you know, thinking about the more left brain, right brain, like the scientific side of things where science perhaps is trying to differentiate and extrapolate out certain things in life and, and kind of beat it back to us as like, yes, this is, this is how it is. Well, yes, maybe in that, that piece of reality, that's how it is. But when you connect it to the entire organism, right, it's, it may not be the story that we're, we're telling about it in mm. the, the scientific community. So um, not sure that everyone experiences their calling in that way, but I, but I certainly have. It's, it's the thing that um, just kept speaking to me like, yeah, yeah, this, this is who you are. And like Gail, I didn't start out as, as a full-time uh, you know, author, journalist, writer, mm -hmm. I went the corporate route as well, because again, I was told that story that, you know, you have to have a real career. And so I spent um, a number of years, over a decade, in, you know, just employee positions um, in marketing and PR and media and, and so forth. And don't regret that, of course, but um, at some point, and it was for me, you know, after I had my two children, it was like my inner self said to myself, you need to get real now. You really need to step into who you're really meant to be in your work. Um, and so that's when things started shifting for me. And I became a whole lot happier <laughs> with, <laughs> with the career that I, that I was embarking upon. <laughs> somebody, somebody once said to me, Gina, and this is, 25 years or more ago and I and I knew it was wrong then but she said to me in all earnestness you are not your work and I was like what you 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 must not understand me at all and and Gail I, I have to tell you I would have been really really surprised if you hadn't been smiling and nodding when Gina said it won't let you rest because you said you can't not do it mm-hmm I know exactly what that feels like. Yeah, well, that's a good segue for me <clears throat> to respond to your question because 
I mean, there's so much to say about that question, but I want to respond to it in relation to what I know about you. And then the question will be answered, but because you, you actually asked the question regarding yourself, is it my calling? Um, is it me? And I'll say that, you know, I've read all the books that you sent me. So it was the children's book and then the other book. And I know you from the bench. And I know that I would say, for whatever reason, I see your calling is that you have to express yourself, whether it's through writing or speaking and the bench that you are. I see it as an inquiry of um, healing. I really do. I'm always, I'm always going right to the healing, but I see that in you big time in every little, every anecdote that you shared in your book, it, it's about healing. And so I want to, we're talking about, you know, writing and story and words. And my response to you is that it's like, it doesn't matter what we even call it. Let's get beyond the words. It's like Let's do it. Like a calling of it. Yes, it's your calling. Yes, it is who you are. How could one not be an expression of the other? So let's not worry about calling it anything. <laughs> let's just do it. You know, just be it. It's like there's it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Like it's mm -hmm. just, it's so you. It's like that's who you are is your need to express yourself in words, in, in writing, like how it's like, so it's just you. <laughs> Does that make sense? But am it, I, it, I don't know. If... You, you know what? It, it absolutely makes perfect sense. And when you started to speak, you used the word segue. So I'm going to steal that one because we're going to take our first commercial break right now. And then I'm going to segue into that whole subject of healing that started when Diane said she was discouraged as, as a child. So we are going to take our first commercial break. We'll be back in three minutes. And you'll know it because you'll hear a soft voice with flute music. Everybody has a story. Everyone's story deserves to be told. And the only bad stories are the ones we don't share. That's why Mark O'Brien created The Anxious Voyage. It's Mark's conviction that every story deserves to be shared, and his purpose is to give people in all walks of life, from any circumstances, a chance to tell their stories. The Anxious Voyage is now on syndicated Dream Vision 7 radio network every Monday at 1 a.m. and 1 p.m. Eastern Time, with live broadcast every first and third Monday at 1 p.m. Eastern. Please tune in, please join Mark, and please share your stories. Ever wonder what it's like to have your own radio show? Well, wonder no longer, because you can dip into the radio airwaves by being host for the day on syndicated Dream Vision 7 Radio Network. It's a fabulous way to get your radio feet wet. It's an opportunity to market your business, modality, or book. Have a guest, mention a sponsor, and take callers. Or you may want to facilitate a lesson by going solo. It's up to you. Listeners can be online, mobile, in cars with Bluetooth, or listen through Amazon's Echo by asking Alexa, play Dream Vision 7 Radio Network. For more details, go to DreamVision7Radio.com and click on Host for the Day. You can't establish your brand's authority without a voice. That's why, since 2004, O'Brien Communications Group, OCG, has been helping companies establish their authority, find their brand's distinct voices, and position their brands effectively and persuasively. So effectively that nine of OCG's clients have been acquired by other companies. OCG's business model emphasizes efficiency and results, not hourly billing, markups, and media commissions. That ensures OCG's advice is unbiased and its clients aren't at financial risk. If you're ready to find your voice and use it to tell your story, OCG is ready to help. You can find O'Brien Communications Group on the web at O'BrienCG.com. That's O-B-R-I-E-N-C-G.com. Or call 860-944-9022.
Calling all authors. Have you been considering an audiobook? Well, look no further. Come take advantage of Dream Vision 7 Radio Network's unique in-house audiobook production, which includes benefits and bonuses from our radio station. Let our knowledgeable staff guide you to create the audiobook you've always dreamed of without breaking the bank. Check out our full one-stop service from A to Z, including the ACX process. Schedule a free consultation by calling 508-226-1723. That's 508-226-1723. Or go to dreamvision7radio.com. This is Dream Vision 7 Radio Network, uniting mankind with universal love. Our shows are created from the heart, bringing each listener to a place of divine enlightenment. Breathe, relax, and enjoy. Let life flow. Welcome back, everyone. Um, I'm glad everyone is still here. Before we officially get into this segment, I just wanted to share something that um, you prompted me to remember, Gail. Um, So, Gail, you made reference to the bench. The bench refers to the friendship bench, which is something that we typically participate in every Thursday morning at 1130. Um, there's a wonderful gentleman from Great Britain named Roger Martin. And um, on one of the benches, he was relating a story in which someone in his family said to me, said to him, I'm sorry, may I ask you a question? And he said, yes, the answer is love. What's the question? And I thought of it because, number one, he's right. And number two, because you reminded me, Gail, that you always equate healing and love. And I think I think that's a beautiful connection. Um, it's not one that I would have made mm-hmm. without you, actually. So as we come into the uh, segment, I just want to share this. And Gail, I know you know that this says, this book is dedicated to every child who ever had a doubt. And you've also revealed here on this show, that's me. Um, But I want to go back to um, what Diane said earlier about children should be seen and not heard, and we were typically discouraged. Um, The first question that occurred to me when you said that, Diane, was, why why does that happen? And and I remember, and, and I would like to know if you do too, I remember very distinctly knowing under understanding that the lion's share, not all, but the lion's share of adults in my life had no appreciation for my intelligence as a child. Why is that? Well, I don't know the answer to that question. But what I would offer is perhaps those big humans didn't have the opportunity as little humans to express. And so what we have is an ongoing situation of a lack. I mean, some people people can say, you know, it's crowd control. And I'm sure that in some cases it was, you know, in religion, it could be crowd control. In education, it certainly could be crowd control or herd control. It's just a lot easier when you have quiet people that you're Mm -hmm. talking at instead of people with whom you want to converse, especially if they're asking questions. I think that's the worst kind of people because they're asking questions. They want to know how come. And then the answer that you get is because I said so. My thought is that, so Thich Nhat Hanh, in whose footsteps I follow, always taught to have compassion for your parents, for your ancestors, if they didn't have access to the teachings. Buddhist teachings of Mm -hmm. compassion and harmony and love and et cetera. And so if I take that and, and apply it to my family and my ancestors, then I get a clear idea of how it was that they went from little humans to big humans. 
And and it's it's that. I, I think it is the rub between how the big humans came up in the world and how they, they take that upbringing and apply it to the little humans. And so the work that I do in large part comes from that experience. Oftentimes the women who come in my door have an overarching question about, I don't have a story to tell, but I need to make a presentation. I have to stand up in front of a group of people and I, I don't know if I'm going to be seen or heard. When That's like the open door question, but underneath that, is an awareness, uh, an awareness that we don't have voices, we don't have stories. If we do, they're not going to be heard or seen or understood or recognized or listened to. That's the work. That's the digging work that has to be done. That's the work of unbalancing the status quo. And so when I say that I help women be seen, heard, understood, and listened to while unbalancing the status quo. It is that. It is that. So that we can, going back to what Gail was saying about connection, so that we can engage and connect and affirm one another. So my my work as, as a storyteller applied to peace in the world would be this. I think that we have great big block parties, wherever you live, wherever you are, block parties. And everybody brings a dish that's a favorite of theirs. And they bring with them the story about why that dish is their favorite. Maybe their auntie made it or it represents a certain tradition. It doesn't matter. Bring a dish to share. Bring a story about why that dish is, is coming with you to the block party. And then we all sit down and we eat and we trade stories. And I guarantee you, before the end of the night, we'll have world peace. And people will have had chance to be seen and heard and understood and listened to. And that that's another age of Aquarius. Um, Gail and Gina, just so you know, I'm going to come ask you the same question too. Um, I know, because I read this book, I know that Brandy found affirmation through working with you and working with you to tell her story. I also very strongly suspect that you found affirmation as well. Would that be fair? That I found that information? That you found affirmation in working on this book as well. Oh, affirmation, oh my God. Yeah, it was, yes, I knew that I had a gift and that was that was like I there was no <laughs> there was no denying that I could connect the dots in such a way to really um, because again for me it's about the healing and how the universe you know as you know in the story how the universe conspired the divinity of what happened to bring this mother and this daughter together. And um, yes, it was very affirming, very affirming mm -hmm. about that, about the fact that I believe that not only known, it, that's not the right word. It's not belief because a belief is a thought, but that I experience, I live that the truth that there is some kind of divine order that is guiding us in our lives. I mean, it certainly doesn't mean we don't have pain and discomfort. I mean, on the contrary, I think that's what is our impetus to let go of what we need to so we can know who we truly are and that we are one with God or the universe. That's my beliefs. And I, I forgot I forgot where I was going with this. I'm sorry. Sometimes I, I, I make these connections and they go all over the place. And then sometimes I lose track of what I was trying to say. I'm sorry. That's all right. And Gina, I, I do want to ask you because I, I also have the distinct sense. And, and, and I know from having spoken with you about this before that you went through a period in which poetry was just sort of 
revealing itself to you. And and so you would get up and, and write it down. And then I know you did this collection and there must have been affirmation in that as well. But I just want to share this before we move on. Yeah, I knew when I read this that I would never forget. It's on page 229. I will always remember this is on page 229. Judgment, judgments aren't necessary. What was wrong for them was perfect for Tim and me. Their acting on their truths allowed for the unfolding of true harmony. Right. 229. Never forget it. So Gina, uh, I, I would like to know what was affirming in your experience with working with all those other poets whom you obviously revere and rightly so because their work is brilliant um what what kind of affirmation aside from what you gave to them by believing in their work did you derive from working on that you you are on mute gina how did i get muted I don't know. I, I, my my, I'm going with gremlins. I I don't know. <laughs> so I'd love to answer that question and also uh, answer the previous question that you had asked about why does this happen? Why are we discouraged when we're young? And I think it's a multi-pronged answer and a really important question to ask. Um, and we're not going to solve that on today's call, but it is definitely societal. It's definitely cultural, it's definitely generational, it's it's all of those things. Um, and I also agree that at some point, you know, well, I'll say too that I feel a lot of it is a trauma response too, like people are just acting out their, their stress or their trauma on you as a child. And that's why I feel like it's important to, um, you know, to Diane's point, forgive your parents and to not blame others, but to just know, I mean, I kind of look at it like, it's just what happened to me, you know? I mean, it was, yeah, it was traumatic. I mean, my mom literally like burned my writing journal, you know, when I was out at senior prom one night um, and things like that happened, but it's just what happened. And that's the way that I tend to look at that as well as other traumas that have happened in my life because like none of us get out unscathed and we're not here to get out unscathed. We're here to have all of life happen to us, right? So um, the, the sooner we can get beyond that, that place of I was wounded and we can get into the healing of the wounding and get on with it, then I think that the better off we are. And again, you know, I think a lot of this, this weight that's put on children is because the, the adults aren't resolved yet in themselves, you know, and so they just, mm -hmm. you know, transpose that onto the kids. So the more we can work on our own inner healing and our own um, self-realization, the better off everybody will be, especially those who become parents and have kids, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but your question about affirmation, you know, it's, it really does, for some kooky, odd reason, bring me great joy <laughs> to help others get to the point where they're expressing themselves to the world, you know, to an audience, to um, come out of their own hiding and and help them, their writing in particular, you know, see the light of day. And so when this intuition came to me about partnering with other poets, and collaborating and co-creating this book together, which is called Essential Astonishments, it, it really, <laughs> I mean, I have to say, uh, again, oddly, it was the impetus that got me excited about actually writing the book and, and having it go through the publication process. Just me, again, on my own doing it wasn't enough to jazz me. But when I started reading these other poets' work and seeing the threads of the themes that, that were weaving and just the creation of six voices together was really exciting. So that was my affirmation was, you know, they, and it, it was such a seamless process too. I mean, they all just enjoyed the entire process of pulling this book together and publishing it and sharing it. 
Um, there was no, uh, you know, creative uh, disagreements or anything like that, that sometimes happens in collaborative efforts. It was all just joy, joy, joy all the way through. So, um, and yeah, I think, I think we're here to, to experience that joy in our work. I think not enough of us feel a sense of awe or wonderment or joy or um, deep, deep gratification about that, which we toil at. And I don't, I mean, I think that's kind of crazy. I think, you know, again, we're here to live the full human experience. And that doesn't mean, you know, going to a nine to five, wait, watching the clock tick and waiting till the end of the day. You know what I mean? It's just such a, such a relentless cycle um, to do something that you don't enjoy doing. Whereas when you enjoy doing it, just the hours fly by. You don't have enough hours in the day. So, Amen to that. Um, yeah. We will, at this point, take our second and final <laughs> commercial break. We will be back in three minutes, and we'll do it again. See you in a minute. Sorry, three minutes. Are you ready for the quantum age? Humanity's next step in evolution? Dream Vision 7 Radio Network invites you to the extraordinary platform of evolutionary voices for the quantum age. Let's explore. Learn more about this upcoming age where we bridge science with spirituality. Where potentiality meets reality. Where we take compassion into action. Our trailblazers and visionaries will ask the whys, <laughs> the what ifs, while igniting continuous possibility. Come along with us into an age beyond what we know today where we can grow together in unity consciousness experience evolutionary voices for the quantum age monday through friday at 8 a.m and 8 p.m eastern on dreamvision7radio.com you can't establish your brand's authority without a voice. That's why since 2004, O'Brien Communications Group, OCG, has been helping companies establish their authority, find their brand's distinct voices, and position their brands effectively and persuasively. So effectively that nine of OCG's clients have been acquired by other companies. OCG's business model emphasizes efficiency and results, not hourly billing, markups, and media commissions. That ensures OCG's advice is unbiased and its clients aren't at financial risk. If you're ready to find your voice and use it to tell your story, OCG is ready to help. You can find O'Brien Communications Group on the web at O'BrienCG.com. That's O-B-R-I-E-N-C-G.com. Or call 860-944-9022. Calling all authors. Have you been considering an audiobook? Well, look no further. Come take advantage of Dream Vision 7 Radio Network's unique in house audiobook production, which includes benefits and bonuses from our radio station. Let our knowledgeable staff guide you to create the audiobook you've always dreamed of without breaking the bank. Check out our full one stop service from A to Z, including the ACX process. Schedule a free consultation by calling 508 226 1723. That's 508 226 1723. Or go to dreamvision7radio.com. Everybody has a story. Everyone's story deserves to be told. And the only bad stories are the ones we don't share. That's why Mark O'Brien created The Anxious Voyage. It's Mark's conviction that every story deserves to be shared, and his purpose is to give people in all walks of life, from any circumstances, a chance to tell their stories. The Anxious Voyage is now on syndicated Dream Vision 7 radio network every Monday at 1 a.m. and 1 p.m. Eastern Time, with live broadcast every first and third Monday at 1 p.m. Eastern. Please tune in, please join Mark, and please share your stories. This is Dream Vision 7 Radio Network, uniting mankind with universal love. Our shows are created from the heart, bringing each listener to a place of divine enlightenment. Breathe, relax, and enjoy. Let life flow. Welcome back. And oh, sorry. This time the gremlins got me, Gina. Um, Anyway, welcome back. Thank you. I'm, I'm glad you stayed. Um, I, I just want to say, um, as a result of what I noticed about the majority of adults in my young life, um, 
I went out of my way to, to let my sons and now my grandchildren know that I recognize and appreciate their intelligence. Mm -hmm. And some of the things that they have said to me are absolutely mind boggling. Um, I can't imagine how they know what they know mm -hmm. at, at their young ages and to mm -hmm. deprive them of appreciation for that just strikes me as completely wrongheaded. Um, I do want to jump back to something mm -hmm. that you said earlier, Diane, and then Gina, you said something that I at least connected with what Diane said. Diane, you said that when people come to you, whether, whether they need to create some kind of presentation or something, you said they understand that they don't have a story. And what occurred to me when you said that was, they don't recognize that they do have a story. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's our obligation to, to, to draw that out of them. Um, and mm -hmm. Gina, you said something that I thought was remarkably beautiful. You, you talked about your responsibility to bring people out of their own hiding. So I just wanna ask, the three of you, given what we said about the way we grew up and that some of that was probably attributable to um, the unresolved issues, we might not even have to go so far as to say trauma, but from our parents' upbringing. Um, do you think do, do we think that coming out of our hiding is a way of escaping that trauma? Okay, I'll go first, I do. How about if we were to say it's a way of making use of it? Oh, <laughs> this, this is exactly why I love this program and I love the three of you so much. I, I knew all three of you would say things that I would never have thought of. Brilliant. Yes. Make use of that. And what did you mean by escaping, though? That was an interesting choice of words. Oh. Ooh. Well, <laughs> Doesn't maybe. escape indicate a running from? Yeah. Right. Right. Like, why not say healing from our trauma? So, Gail, I don't want you to... I don't want you to think that I'm keeping score, um, but this is the second time in this conversation that you've outed me. <laughs> Uh-oh. I'm joking. I'm <laughs> joking. No, you're, you're exactly right. That is exactly what that indicates. Well, this is why I say that story is medicine and it has been for millennia. Um, I, I doubt that we would even survive or would have survived without story. So I, I don't think that it's necessary to acknowledge the healing as it's happening. It is, you know, writing in particular, and there's a lot of studies that we could get into about the actual connection between the brain and the hand when you're actually writing and not typing, but writing but even just articulating our story. There's something different about writing it than speaking it even mm -hmm. um, that has uh, very, very good effects on, on moving through what we're speaking about. I don't think it's necessary to even say that we're healing because it kind of happens through osmosis mm -hmm. and you don't even really realize it. I mean, I, I know that, you know, all all four of us could talk about um, clients or friends or people that we've encountered who've spoken about the writing process and they refer to it as cathartic, but they don't really realize that there is a catharsis happening as it's happening. It's only in retrospect that you look back and you say, wow, um, I, I feel like I'm resolved about this thing that was really bothering me or I feel like I'm able to now forgive this person for what I perceive that they did to me or for me. 
Mm-hmm. Um, you know, all all of those things that are the result of um, writing being this powerful antidote for moving trauma through the body, through the emotional body. So um, I, you know, I'm a very analytical person, even though I'm creative, very, so I try to dissect and get to the bottom of things. It might be, you know, Scorpio sun sign, I don't know, but I, I try to dissect and, and figure things out. However, I don't think it's always necessary to do that. I think that um, the healing process sort of speaks for itself. And, um, you know, a number of clients that really didn't even realize that they had fully lived and appreciated and seen the benefits of what happened to them in life until after they wrote and published their story. Mm. You know, and, and that's, it's a whole other subject, but that's part and parcel of why publishing your story is so powerful because it sort of brings it to another level of um, acknowledgement not just to other people, but to yourself, mm. you know, and, and you can move again, move on from it. That that's the phrase I used earlier for whatever reason, mm. but you know, we're not here to like repeat our, our same story over and over and over again. It's, it's, it's what my colleague Jean Houston calls getting a PhD in your own pathology. You know, you're just like telling <laughs> it over and over. I think it's more appropriate to, experience and live and share our stories and then create new ones and create new ones and keep going from there as long as we're alive. I, I, I agree with you completely. I've, I've always had this notion and I didn't connect it to our own stories that we can't identify what I refer to as defining moments when they happen. Oh, that was, no, that's not how it works at all. It's, it's, it's always retrospective. So, Gail, Diane, anything to share on that? I'd like I'd, to. I'd li- go ahead. No, yeah, go on, Gail. <laughs> Thanks. Yes, I wanted to add <clears throat> the other perspective that when you read somebody else's story, that right there is that healing as well, because it's like, we're all here wanting the same thing. You know, I've said this before, like we're all come here wanting to love, to feel love, to love others, to have others love us and to love our own selves. We're all the same. And story connects us in that way because we all have our unique experiences that we go through, our unique traumas. But by reading somebody else's trauma, you can see the truth in their story and how it's reflected back to your own self. So there's the writing of it and the processing of it for the the writer, but the people that they're sharing their story with incredible healing happens because we're all so much more alike than we are different. And that's the universal nature of the healing universality of it. We all want the same thing. And story is that link. Diane. One of the reasons We invite people to a marriage ceremony is so that they can be witness. And oftentimes, uh, whoever is conducting that ceremony will invoke the witnesses and say, because this marriage is taking place in front of you and you are witnessing the vows between these two people, it's, it's a way of cementing it if you will. What hasn't been said, but I believe has been inferred over this time in our conversation is that invariably there is a witness to the story. Gail will be witnessing someone's memoir. Gina will be witnessing someone's poetry. Mark, you'll be witnessing when you get children to tell stories. And it's the power of the witness that says, or witnesses, that says, this happened. 
this happened this way. We hear what you're saying. We see you. We understand you. We are listening to you. So the role of the witness, I believe, is what brings that story to life so that the storyteller will end up saying, I, I didn't realize I had these words. I didn't realize this. Yes. So we are midwifing this work out of the various people with whom we work so that their words can be witnessed and then can become part of the collective story. Because like C.S. Lewis says, what, you too? I thought I was the only one. You're not. You're not. So Your I don't story if, I, is. if I mentioned page 229 yet, um, yes. it, it's the notion of that universal harmony. And it's it's in revealing that that we all do realize how alike we are and 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 how much we actually share. Um and, and I and I also want to add that you know each each of us made reference to um I'm going to have to use the word trauma again, sorry, but, you know, individual traumas in our lives. But the idea that those traumas are unique only to us is absolutely ridiculous. So I can't remember uh, exactly the word you used, Diane, um, when you uh, contrasted it against escaping, um, but you're exactly right. Did you say use I it? I'd say composting it. Our Ooh. lives are compost. Oh. And oh. so we've got orange peels and coffee grounds and red bread crumbs and all that stuff. And we throw it out in the backyard if we're lucky enough <laughs> or in a jar under our sink. And it in time becomes fertilizer. And as Thich Nhat Hanh says, no mud, no lotus. You can't grow a lotus on marble. You have to grow it in mud. And so our lives are mud. Our lives are compost and all that stuff that we've collected, if we can use it well, we'll end up fertilizing our lives rather than be just a big old pile of manure. Okay, so I have to tell you that I should have left time in this segment for all of you to talk about how our listeners and viewers could find you. And I didn't have it in me to shorten this conversation in any way, so I didn't do it. But I will really reiterate my promise from the beginning. When I share this recording, I will make sure that there are links to your websites and your books and everything else. So everybody who's participated in this live broadcast and who witnesses the recordings will have access to it. And I just want to end with one question, Diane. Um, are you working on your book yet, Whidbey Island as Metaphor? <laughs> the witch of Whidbey. I will tell you very quickly, I have been handed the privilege of narrative consulting a 450 page memoir. So, <laughs> okay. The witch I, of Whidbey's I, taking a back seat right now. <laughs> I, I love that. I am immensely grateful to the three of you for being here today and for sharing with me what you did. Um, please don't be uh, threatened if I invite the three of you to come back. I would dearly love to do that. Um, and in the meantime, to everyone else who joined us today, I will be back on July 1st with Paula Parker and Nick Sternberg. See you then. Thank you for tuning into The Anxious Voyage, the program dedicated to sharing stories, helping people, and celebrating life. You can see and listen to The Anxious Voyage on syndicated Dream Vision 7 radio network every Monday at 1 a.m. and 1 p.m. Eastern Time with live broadcast every first and third Monday at 1 p.m. Eastern. If you have a story to tell or if you know someone who does, please email the host, Mark O'Brien, at mark at O'BrienCG.com. In the meantime, please remember, the only bad stories are the ones we don't share. This is Dream Vision 7 Radio Network, uniting mankind with universal love. Our shows are created from the heart, bringing each listener to a place of divine enlightenment. Breathe, relax, and enjoy. Let life flow.